The archipelago of New Caledonia was first populated about 50,000 years ago by the Lapita people, highly skilled navigators and agriculturalists, and later the Austronesians, who arrived to mix with the population of these islands. The big island of New Caledonia, Grand Terre, stretches out like a huge beche de mer, a sea cucumber, in the Pacific, with a loyalty islands group made up of several smaller outer islands and reefs lining from north to south, with a population exceeding 252,000. The country adopted the Kanak flag in 2010. Three horizontal bands of colour, green for vegetation, red as a symbol of the people's blood, and blue for the sea and sky. Overlying these bands is a yellow solar disc with a hut ridge pole. The local flag has flown alongside the existing French tricolor of blue, white and red. The shared national reference is of the land, ancestral land for Canaks, a land of exile for settlers and a land of welcome for recent immigrants. The island of Lifu, formerly called Drehu, is the largest of the islands in the Loyalty Island group and stands in the shape of a puppy begging for food. Its only harbour lies in a tiny crook on its eastern shores, with a large breakwater to protect the small marina from the prevailing southeasterlies. Tourists seeking lodgings are offered tribal stays by the villagers in their traditional styled thatched huts or small guest houses. Like all of the loyalty islands, Lifu is made of fossil coral, Makatea. Millions of years ago, a volcano arose from the ocean and eventually a coral barrier reef formed around it. The central island subsided back into the sea, leaving behind a coral atoll. About two million years ago, the coral atoll central lagoon was slowly raised by geological processes. It rose about 80 metres out of the sea and Lifu now has old coral cliffs and a forested plateau that was once the central lagoon. Lifu Island is the largest raised atoll in the world. The traditional design of a village had the chief's hut, La Grande Casse, a round conical shaped house, at the end of a long and wide central walkway, a place used for gathering and for performing the village ceremonies. The chief's next youngest brother lived in a hut at the other end. The rest of the village lived in huts along the central walkway, which is lined with palms. Today these Grand Casse houses are more commonly built for family gatherings and are a symbol of a powerful family clan. The tribe elders held a prominent place, yet individuals were equally recognised regardless of their status. Individual land ownership does not exist. The land belongs to everyone, and the law of covenants governs joint ownership. Lifu's main settlement is Wei, a large village that stretches along the seafront. This small island is greatly diversified, with Lifu's northern coast famous for its 40 metres high cliffs, which overhang crystal clear waters teeming with fish. The constant pounding of the Pacific Ocean has carved out numerous caverns, some up to four kilometres long, and filled with stalactites, stalagmites and jade water holes. These caves were created over a long time, more than 125,000 years ago. New Caledonia and the Loyalty Islands were first sighted by British explorer James Cook in 1774 during his second voyage to the Pacific, who named it New Caledonia after Scotland, as part of the main island reminded him of the Scottish Highlands. Cook and his crew aboard HMS Resolution anchored off the northeast coast on the 5th of September and spent 10 days exploring the region. Cook was struck by the civility of the natives and made a gift of a pair of dogs to the Kanak chief, Tipuma. He also introduced pigs to these islands by gifting a pair of pigs to another chief. Cook later commented that the natives were robust and active, courteous and friendly, of honest nature, and the women modest, unlike the ones they had found on Tahiti. 
Along with the Europeans came new diseases such as smallpox, measles, dysentery, influenza, syphilis and leprosy, and many people died as a result of these diseases, like many indigenous people did as a result of European exploration. Arrogant attitudes and cheating became commonplace. Tensions developed into hostilities, and in 1849, the crew of the American ship Cutter were killed and eaten by the Puma tribe, the Wind Demon Clan. Cannibalism was widespread throughout New Caledonia, as it was in the rest of the South Pacific. After 1840, British and North American whalers and sandalwood traders exploited New Caledonia. When the supplies of sandalwood declined, traders became abusive, and New Caledonia became a target for black birding, a euphemism which involved the capture and enslaving of people to work in sugarcane plantations in Fiji and Queensland in Australia. The arrival of missionaries from the August London Missionary Society, among others, in the 1840s, had a profound effect on indigenous culture. They insisted that people should wear clothes to cover themselves, and they introduced cricket and tea. They firmly eradicated many local practices and traditions. Nickel mining is still the most important sector in the economy of New Caledonia, which is the world's fifth largest producer. As in much of the world, environmental issues do not seem to be that important, at least to industrialists and politicians. Here, many wetlands have either been lost or spoiled. Stripping of hill slopes causes erosion. Rivers and streams have been choked with tailings from the waste materials dumped from the mines. This has resulted in a rise of water levels in the rivers and consequent flooding of fertile agricultural lands. River deltas have created changes in aquatic flora and fauna. Streams, river estuaries and bays in their middle and lower reaches are reportedly affected by the red clay subsoil, which covers the mangrove forests. Discharges from the factories have also recorded high levels of nickel, arsenic and lead. However, it is also observed that nickel mining is a politically sensitive subject. It remains the most important economic sector on the island, and mining continues. Still told is the Kanak legend of how New Caledonia and its loyalty islands were born. The king of the universe had a son. He was calm, obedient, docile and peaceful. He was big, deep, blue and so clear that the king named him Pacific. Pacific used to play with the islands, adorning them with the brightest colours, caressing their coasts, lapping against the rocks. Never did he get angry. Many years later, when Pacific was fully grown, one night a violent shaking awoke him. The rumbling grew stronger and stronger. In the early morning, the sun rose with a red, orangey glow, and the water opened up before him. From the deep black hole a long and thin piece of ground emerged, an island. He fondled her coasts and decorated her with long strips of bright white sand. Still the island slept. To brighten her with colour he gave to her the most beautiful and also the rarest fish. Catfishes, sunfishes, all colourful and silvery species. Still the island slept. To seduce her, he brought from the deep water the finest shells. She was still impassive. He shaped her east coast wild and proud with steep and stony shores sloping into the ocean. He designed her west coast to be gentle and peaceful, edged with bronze beaches. One day he was working so tirelessly on her southern shore that he cut himself. His blood stained the coast up to the hillsides of his beloved island. After years of calm, quiet and patience, his island still slept. Completely exhausted, he now slept for three days and three nights. At the dawn of the third day, he woke to see a little pearl island delicately lying on the bright water. 
This island was so small, so delicate with colours of sapphire blue, emerald green and turquoise so fine. It was bordered with majestic trees. Cheerful and compliant, she was clearly there to be offered to a queen. Then, with a last surge of love, he brought the Pearl Island near the big island that he loved so much. Very soon thereafter, the big island glowed with shaded trees. Trees enriched her, flame-coloured stones trimmed her coasts. She was endowed with fragrant flowers, sweet fruits, fluorescent butterflies and birds with never-ending song. At last, Pacific was happy. His beautiful island was awake and alive. The island, as proof of her immense love to Pacific, gave him three children, Uvea, Lifu and Mare. Settled by France during the first half of the 19th century, the island was formally taken possession by the French on the 24th of September 1853 under orders from Emperor Napoleon III. It served as a penal colony for four decades after the mid-19th century, with about 22,000 criminals and political prisoners being transported to New Caledonia over the years. Only 40 of them settled in the colony, the rest returned to France after being granted amnesty in 1879. As a penal colony, New Caledonia had a slightly better reputation than that other French establishment at Devil's Island in French Guiana. New Caledonia's main island, Grand Terre, is an island 350 kilometres long by 50 kilometres wide. It's bordered with 1,600 kilometres of coastline, is a botanist's paradise and is surrounded by the world's largest lagoon. The island's deep red soil is unique because it was formed from rocks from the oceanic crust, which very rarely occurs. These rocks are rich in minerals, mostly nickel, magnesium, chromium and manganese. Because of the high concentration of these minerals, the soils of New Caledonia have unique varieties of plant communities living on them, including a wide collection of quite rare ancient trees. Nickel mines have stripped and scarred Grand Terre since, in 1864, nickel was discovered on the banks of the Dioho River. In 1876, mining began in earnest. The French imported labourers from neighbouring islands to work in the mines and attempted to encourage European immigration without much success. About 10% of the world's known nickel supplies lie in New Caledonia and, over the years, nickel mining has, and still does, provide a very high proportion of the gross domestic product of New Caledonia. However, this has not been without its problems. There has been extreme pollution of the air and the waters of the island. Wetlands and water supplies have been seriously compromised and the open cast mining techniques of the past have grievously scarred mountainsides and huge areas of countryside. There has been great friction between the industrialists on the one hand and those who would protect the environment on the other. The indigenous population were ultimately confined to reservations, excluded from the French economy, even as workers in the mines, which sparked a violent reaction in 1878 as High Chief Atal launched a guerrilla war which cost the lives of 200 Frenchmen and over 1,000 Kanaks. The Kanak population declined from around 60,000 in 1878 to less than half of that by the early 20th century, due to a combination of wars and the egregious blackbirding. In March 1942, soon after the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, New Caledonia became an important American military base, with Noumea appointed as the headquarters of the United States Navy and Army in the South Pacific. The 23rd Infantry Division, more commonly known as the American Division, moved in and American troops numbered up to 50,000 men, almost the equivalent of the contemporary local population. 
This was an immediate emergency response following the US declaration of war on Japan. In 1946, New Caledonia became an overseas territory of France, and by 1953 French citizenship was granted to all New Caledonians regardless of ethnicity. This main settlement of New Caledonia was initially called Port de France and was renamed Noumea in 1866. The city is situated on an irregular hilly peninsula near the southeast end of New Caledonia. The city maintains much of New Caledonia's unique mix of French and old Melanesian culture. Musée de la Ville de Noumea is on the original site of the first Caledonian bank. This colonial-style town hall operated from 1880 to 1975. Now the fragrant gardens and exhibits display a permanent recreation of the history surrounding these islands. Lapita pottery, displaying its characteristic designs, are some of the earliest traces of the human presence in New Caledonia. Dated to 2500 BC, this pottery was made with clay from swamps and sand. Generally dispersed along the west coast, it ceased to be made, apparently, in the 2nd or 3rd century AD. The sudden end of the Lapita period is a marked curiosity about the history of New Caledonia. There is exceptional quality in the ornamentation of this pottery that has been found extending more than 4,500 kilometers across the Pacific Southwest. Ceramic findings, followed over spans of up to a thousand and more years, have caused some to wonder about the curious distribution of Lapita pottery. New Caledonia is the Pacific archipelago where the largest numbers of well-preserved fragments of Lapita pottery have been discovered with no fewer than 30 different sites. With its sudden disappearance about 1600 years ago, it leaves historians wondering. Was it a time for a change? Did the civilizations die or did they move inland and become what is known as Kanak today? Melanesian religion contained a multiplicity of gods, culture heroes and spirits with varied characters and roles. Particular powers were associated with creation, the sustenance of the world in which they lived, war, fertility, prosperity and welfare. The appropriate god had to be placated through a variety of rites and sacrifices in order to ensure the tribe's success and well-being. The spirits of the dead were most important in terms of bringing success and blessing to the tribe. The dead, whose names were remembered always and with reverence, were usually still seen as part of the community and to hurt their feelings could bring on troubles to the tribe. Ghosts who were dissatisfied spirits were often identified separately from the settled dead. The ghosts of men who died in battle were Danny warriors and required placating by a killing of the enemy. The coastal god Roro was highly respected for he could inflict difficulties upon a family if a member was killed unexpectedly. But it was the ancestors, when conceived to have reached the proper place of the dead, who were the spiritual sources of help most frequently and consistently relied upon through time. Complex ceremonies were a vital and valued part of Kanak culture. The clan, not the individual, was the most important element of these ceremonies, and they encompassed rites, rituals and social interaction between the clans. This essential component represents Kanak identity even today. However, Kanak customs and beliefs have weathered the worst periods of colonization, but not without transformations and losses. A tindalo is an image representing a dead but once powerful man and is often used in ceremonial occasions. A New Caledonian elder once wrote, We believe these tindalo have once been our living men, men with power, and the power that was with them can now be ours to use as we wish. We can use it to achieve a thing forbidden, tambu, or a thing abominable, 
Umbuto. This is the power of those to whom the Tindalo belongs. Standing alone in a quiet corner of this island is the stunning Jean-Marie Gibao Cultural Center, which celebrates the culture of the Kanak, the indigenous people of the island. The construction of this museum represented a great triumph for the Kanak people, for it represented an acknowledgement of the dignity of the indigenous people of New Caledonia. The French colonial masters had long ignored the desires and aspirations of the Aboriginal inhabitants of the region, and the opening of this museum was an admission of that neglect. The French spent lavishly on its design and construction, bringing in the world-renowned Italian architect Renzo Piano, who recently, in July 2012, opened his latest building in London, UK, the Extraordinary Shard Building the tallest freestanding building in the European Union. The centre features ten wooden pavilions modelled after the traditional great huts of the Kanak chiefs. These large, iconic vernacular buildings were born to represent an intense communion with nature and natural elements such as wind, light and vegetation, to house a wide variety of contemporary Melanesian and Oceanic cultural artworks, as well as many older traditional pieces. Architect Renzo Piano has used the recurrent theme of the Araucaria pine, better known as the monkey puzzle tree. The centre commemorates leader Jean-Marie Gibao of the Kanak independence movement a former priest and student in Paris in 1968. Jibao was murdered by another Kanak, who regarded Jibao's signing of the Matignon Accord, the framework for a constitutional future, as a betrayal of his people. This beehive-shaped structure contains a variety of exhibitions showcasing the art and craft of the Kanaks. The main artworks are sculptures, necklaces and paintings. Contemporary sculptures exhibit the beliefs of traditional tribal society, but also reflect the realities of today's society. These works are often representations of humans with a stylized body and a very expressive face. Cultural expression takes many forms, but wood carving, especially of hoop wood, is probably one of the most symbolic and is recognized all over the world. There are totem poles, masks, carved door jams, door posts or door frames with massive broad faces and patterns around zigzags and diamonds. Engraved bamboo features geometric motifs and images of fish, boats and guns. These carvings often depict interactions between early Europeans and Kanaks. The shapes of their traditional houses are very characteristic and have become a new Caledonian art form. High conical dwellings that feature striking door frames. The inside of a grand casse, as they are known, is dominated by the central pole made out of hoop wood, which holds up the roof. And the rooftop spears or arrows that decorate the roof of major ceremonial houses, those of the revered founding ancestors of the clan. Inside and along the walls are various posts which have been carved to represent ancestors. The door is flanked by two carved door posts called katana, the sentinels who reported the arrival of strangers. There is also a carved doorstep. More stylized carvings representing clan ancestors are found throughout. The rooftop spire or spear has three main parts. The spear facing up, which prevents bad spirits from coming down onto the ancestor, the face which represents the ancestor, and the spear on the bottom which keeps bad spirits from coming up to the ancestor. This dwelling is a place for the spirit of those who were regarded as a source of strength and beneficence. Melanesians have produced a wide variety of religious art forms. Among the most important art forms are sculptures or masks depicting spirits or ancestors. Other visual forms consist of ceremonial bowls, 
coconut drinking cups, shields, drums, belt ornaments, canoe prows, which contain a variety of motives, all representing some aspect of one or the other of their ancestors. Basketry is a craft widely practiced by tribal women, creating objects for use in their daily lives. Kanak society has several layers of customary authority and the indigenous people hold to traditional beliefs regarding civil matters such as marriage, adoption, inheritance, land issues and the use of corporal punishment that clash with the human rights obligations of France. Corporal punishment in the home and schools is practiced everywhere on these islands and banned nowhere. In New Caledonia, the traditional instrument for walloping children is a dried stingray's tail. The French administration typically respects decisions made in the customary system. However, their jurisdiction is sharply limited in serious penal matters. New Caledonia's Grand Terre Island is surrounded by the largest lagoon in the world. The coral reef uniting the archipelago of islands is listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is comprised of six marine clusters making up one of the world's most extensive coral reef systems. Translucent lagoons of exceptional natural beauty and blue tropical waters contain a diversity of coral and fish species and a continuum of habitats from mangroves to sea grasses. They provide habitat to a large number of threatened marine species, such as turtles and whales. The city of Noumea, often referred to as a little piece of France in the South Pacific, combines all the laid-back atmosphere of the South Pacific with the urban elegance of France. From the profusion of old French colonial houses with ornate wrought iron balconies, tree-lined squares and men playing pétanque or boule. The rustic elegance of the French provincial town blends in harmony with the Melanesian culture. The French have brought European style and elegance that has combined with the life of the Kanak. Bakeries are on every corner and baguette, carried like batons, are a common sight. There are French-inspired cafes, restaurants and designer-label shopping, Parisian style. French is the primary language, yet the air is filled with a blend of French and English along with more than 30 Melanesian languages. Even with all of this French influence, the Melanesian culture remains alive and strong. Ancient beliefs here had many things in the natural world associated with a mystical or spiritual significance, often relating to the ancestors and the origins and history of the people. The different plants even had symbolic meanings. The land was spiritual as well as being a material source of life. Their habitat was worshipped and there was no distinction between magic or myth and the natural world. In the past, knowledge was not held equally by everyone, but rather by specialization in the community. Each family often had its own knowledge and magic passed from generation to generation, and each family had its own assigned hereditary role in the community. The earliest of Melanesian music was primarily vocal, with drums, flutes, pipes and slit log gongs. Sitting dances with hand gestures are an important part in ceremonial celebrations. Bamboo music was later made by hitting open-ended bamboo tubes of varying sizes, originally with coconut husks. Music, dance and singing are part of Kanak ceremonial function during initiation rites, courting, marriage, death and mourning. And at the sound of a conch shell being blown, a clan chief has probably made an arrival or the voice of an ancestor is to be heard. The music of Caledonia has evolved just as the earth has changed its shape. Europeans came with guitars and ukuleles which have become the Kaneka form of local music inspired by reggae with added flutes, percussion and harmonies from the 1980s. Bunya is a traditional Kanak casserole. It is made of sliced root vegetables 
which is then wrapped in banana leaves before being cooked over hot stones in an earthen oven. The Museum of Maritime History has been open since 1999 in the port's old passenger ferry terminal. To visit the Maritime Museum is to journey through 3,000 years of seafaring history and to plunge into the mysterious world of long-distance ocean crossings and European navigation and exploration. Probably, at first more by accident than design, the islands of the South Pacific were reached by early navigators sailing or drifting from Southeast Asia. The early construction of the Lapita people's vessels varied according to the available materials. When large trees were available, they would carve a dugout canoe. Where smaller trees were available, construction was quite different and normally involved joining together planks of wood with glue, often made from the sap of the breadfruit tree, then tied together using coconut fibres. Exhibitions trace the history of New Caledonia since the arrival of the first navigators through to Europeans and the era of whale hunting and sandalwood trading to the presence of the Americans during the war in the Pacific. New Caledonia's hazardous circle of coral reefs caused numerous ships to be wrecked on the vicious coral barriers in the 19th and 20th centuries. Relics salvaged from wrecked ships are exhibited, including artefacts from some early 18th century French explorations. Melanesian navigation was done by reading the constellations, by knowing the sea and learning the tides and the currents. Europeans arrived in their much larger ships, sails flying high with sophisticated navigation tools to guide their passage. They came with telescopes, compasses, sextants and the ability to create charts for future voyages. In their wisdom, lighthouses were later strategically placed to avoid the loss of ships on the reefs. Memorabilia over the passage of time have been collected and placed in this tiny museum deep in the South Pacific, remembering those that have come and gone by sea. Melanesians in their handcrafted outriggers, Europeans in their tall ships, and Americans even left their part of history. Sunken Japanese and American warships, the detritus from World War II. Various races of people from around the world have all crossed this vast Pacific Ocean, but it is the Melanesians of today and the Kaldosh, that is, white people born in New Caledonia, who are the ones that now shape the society of the islands. They have made their mark in history and have left bits and pieces of their part in time, some of them here in this museum. Overlooking the city of Noumea and the vast lagoon, high on the slopes of Mount Montravel and spreading across 36 acres, is the Michel Corbasson Zoological and Forest Park. This park is home to a wide variety of unique New Caledonia flora and fauna, from fowl to reptiles and mammals. New Caledonia's emblem is the rare kagu bird, a crested, long-legged and bluish-grey bird endemic to the dense mountain forests of New Caledonia. It is able to run fast, is a flightless bird, but is able to use its wings to climb branches or to glide. Other birds include Caledonian notu and uvea parakeets, pigeons and the very intelligent Caledonian crow, a bird noted for its tool-making abilities which rival that of primates. These crows are renowned for their extraordinary intelligence and ability to fashion tools to solve problems and they make the most complex tools of any animal yet studied apart from humans. And no aviary would be complete without the beautifully adorned peacocks that invariably strut their stuff and the pink flamingos who rather lazily and gracefully seek out a bit of shade. New Caledonia has many unique species of birds and plants and has the richest diversity in the world per square kilometre. In its botany, not only endemic species but entire genera and families are unique to the island. In its fauna, the New Caledonian blossom bat is the only mammal native to this island and also home to the largest gecko in the world, thought to be extinct but rediscovered in 2003. 
This biodiversity is enabled by Grand Terre's central mountain range, which has created a, a variety of niches, landforms and microclimates where species thrive and become endemic. The island's fauna and flora descend from ancient species isolated in the region when it broke away from Gondwana, the southernmost landmass of the two supercontinents, many millions of years ago. Today, those original supercontinents have drifted apart and make up today's southern hemisphere. The people of these islands have become as diverse as the languages that they speak. They once worshipped their ancestor through sacred stones and devotional hearths where they offered sacrifices. The traditional belief of the Kanak people is that the sea is sacred, for it provides them with fish for food, and they still treat it with great reverence. The leading family of the community provided a chief, a symbol for the clan, who provided political leadership, announcing decisions that were taken after consultation with appropriate specialists. Other families provided priests, war chiefs, orators and other figures in the community. Many of these specialists had a role in managing environmental resources. The elders were the masters of the land, distributed it and preserved in their memories the record of all land boundaries and ownership. There was often a master of dry male crops like yams and one or more masters of wet or female crops like taro, bananas and sugarcane. These agricultural technicians decided the timing of gardening operations. The doctors and healers had their special knowledge of sicknesses, medicines and other treatment. Fishing, knowledge and magic were held by the families responsible for supplying fish to the chief. In many cases, magic was unwittingly based on scientific knowledge, allowing the holder of that knowledge to predict the probable outcome of natural events. A family figurehead on Lifu was thought to have had magic whereby he could walk onto a headland to ask his god to send him fish. Nowadays, it is claimed, when the wind blows from that direction, it still blows fish up on the sand, just as it did the day after the magician performed his rites. It is possible this magic was related to a natural local phenomenon, and the magician may have achieved his end by reading the natural signs. He was foreseeing an event that was about to happen anyway. He did not know the reasons, but was intent on securing his title as the wide food supplier of fish to the tribe anyway. A certain family clan might be foresters or carpenters with knowledge of trees and the qualities of each wood, the techniques for cutting and hauling a tree to the building site, and the construction of huts or the making of canoes. Other families might own magic to control the sun, the rain, cyclones or the land breeze to chase away bad weather. These different specializations were not mutually exclusive and the number varied with the area and the size of the community. The roles could also be combined. A sculptor might also be a surgeon since both required similar cutting skills. A knowledge or skill was intimately related to the myth or magic with which it was inherited. In New Caledonia, a missionary once described the case of a skilled sculptor and surgeon whose confidence rested in his gift to sculpt from his deified ancestors. When he became a Christian, this confidence was destroyed and his skill was lost. These islands in many ways are little changed from ancient times in most areas outside of Noumea. In this capital city, multi-architectural designs coexist with the traditional conical Grand Cass houses, wooden colonial homes, the Art Deco cottages with their straight lines and zigzags, and finally, the flat roofs of the 1960s. The storytelling tradition remains strong, and when the sun drops low on the horizon, the air fills with wood smoke drifting along the valleys for the evening meal is being prepared. Stories are told of the ancient sounds of Kanaks hollowing out tree trunks for large double-hulled outrigger canoes, and the beatings of the mulberry tree branches for tapper cloth, and the beating of the drums and the slit gongs. The modern-day Kanaks 
have at last given voice to the idea that they, as the land's first occupants, are hosts to those who came later to make New Caledonia their home, and for those who still come to this island paradise, if only for a visit. New Caledonia is one of a kind, one with a little taste of France. In leaving New Caledonia, we cleared the reef through past beyond, hoisted our mainsail and unfurled the jib. Without much warning, we soon had 35 knots of wind. We sailed hard for seven long days and without much rest on this wind, with two reefs in the main and only a storm jib, across the coral sea towards the great barrier reef. Under clear blue skies and a downhill boisterous trade wind, we were bound for Queensland in Australia. <laughs>